Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and get get this party started. Thank you. Well, guys, welcome to uh, another episode of Simply Champagne with your favorite champagne sommelier here, Prince Anthony, and I have a very special guest, someone who I've been following for a while, who I'm very intrigued to pick his brain on champagne because he is doing something I hope to one day achieve and to become as to be a full-time champagne buyer either for myself or for somebody else and i have with me mr gary westby of KL wines how are we doing this afternoon oh i'm doing great it's really a big honor for me to be here talking to you and um i have pleasure. love everything that you do and it's been fun for me to listen to the listen to past interviews and um it's a I'm pinching myself. I can't believe I'm here. So thank you. <laughs> well, it's such an honor. It's really an honor to have you a uh, part of our part of our journey and uh, being a part of who we are. And uh, again, thank you so so much. So getting started, uh, can you share with us your champagne journey? How did you uh, become a champagne buyer for Canel Wines, and what sparked your passion for this particular wine region? Well, when when I turned 21. Um, my father encouraged me to um, get a part-time job in a wine shop because um, at the time I was uh, I was playing the bass for a really really bad half of a living <laughs> and um, and then making up the shortfall in bike shop and my dad said you know what you should you should try you should try for the wine world he's a wine collector and he can and spurring me on um, to, to taste stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. so I went, and to my surprise, they hired me at the same rate that I was making at the bike shop. <laughs> and the base, because if you're in the bike business, well, if you, if you want to go into the wine business, the only business you can get a raise from going into the wine business to, from is the bike business. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so it was. Um, I, I started off with a, another retailer that sadly is now closed, um, but I worked there, and it was on the job that I discovered a love for champagne. Um, nice. It was in the it was in the run up to Y two K, and um, the the wine buyer. There was this one wine buyer there, and he, um, you know, there was this big worry that everybody was going to run out. For the year 2000 for the 1999 party and um so he started bringing in um growers and at the time it was such a such a niche thing so unheard of we literally had floor stacks of solos floor stacks of egli ori <laughs> you know like all of these producers that have become cult producers now at the time, it was just like, yeah, how many do you want? We'll ship them. <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely started. If you start out with those, I definitely get you the itch for real to dive deeper into it. Yeah. <laughs> but then I got recruited away in February of 2000 to K&L. Um, they were looking to expand what they were doing with, um, with, with Champagne. And um, very quickly thereafter started off as, as the Champagne buyer. And... We, um, at the time, we'd had a really, really big um, private label business nice. with one of the major negotiations. Um, but the deal, the deal sort of soured because of the importer whose name will remain secret to protect the guilty. <laughs> but um, the, then Clyde said, look, we've been direct importing Bordeaux for many years. We've done a little bit of importation of, of Italian wines. Why didn't you go to Champagne and find some stuff? Um, so that's what started the the direct importation side um, at K and L. Because we do about half with the major brands and um, at a regular distribution, and then about nice. half direct from from Champagne. Nice, nice, cool. As we all know, those who don't know, K and L wines is very high respected in the wine industry. Uh, as a consumer and also on the professional side. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, the background philosophy of KNL wine as an import and also as a retailer? Yeah, so um, KNL was started in '76, and the name is for Kay and Linda, um, the two wives of our original two owners. Um, now their their sons, um, Brian and Trey, are also um, owners in the business. Um, but the, we've been at it for a long time, and I think one of the most important parts of our history um, is that perhaps we had the first online wine store. Um, could be that somebody else was first, um, but we were certainly among the first. That was back in 1995 um, that we started to, to sell to sell wine online. Um, and now we have three stores, um, one in Hollywood, um, one in Redwood City in the Silicon Valley, basically, um, nice. and one in San Francisco. Um, and we're just about to add a fourth in, in Culver City. Um, so it's uh, that those are brick and mortar retail stores. We also have um, you know a, a sizable online presence. Although unfortunately, over the years, it's become more and more difficult for us to ship out of state because of um, basically because of protectionist in state laws. Absolutely. Well, you guys for your for your retail um, locations is majority of the wines that you guys have is it all can of products or do you guys um, deal with other distributors as well? Well, absolutely we do. So, um, you know, I would say that uh, my my set in Champagne is about 50-50. Um, okay. From, you know, from out of distribution and then from direct importation. So it's my goal. I would love to have every single grand mark. Um, you know, unfortunately, if a certain grand mark is only offering me a price that is a, a wholesale price that's higher than my competitors' retailers, retail, I, I can't carry it. Um, but I would love to carry all of them. Um, as it stands, we carry most of them. We're very, very close partners with Biacar Samon, for example. Um, very, very close partners with Laurent Perrier. Um, you know, super close with with Krug, um, nice. with Bollinger. I mean, with n numerous of, of of the big houses, um, as well as working with other importers, growers such as Kermit Lynch and yeah. also Skernick. We we work we work well with um, you know the, the Skernick portfolio as well. Nice, good deal, good deal. As a champagne buyer, what factors and considerations do you prioritize when selecting champagnes for the portfolio? Uh, the main thing for me is to, uh, I try to imagine my cu a customer for it. Um, I try to imagine a customer for the champagne before I buy it. Absolutely. Um, and of course, um, you know, I want to also have, a, I, want to, I want to represent champagne well. You know, if we didn't have negotiants and co-ops and growers, um, we wouldn't be doing a good job of representing Champagne. If we didn't have a number of good producers from the Cote de Blanc, a number of good producers from the Montcalm de Rems, a number of good producers from the Valley of the Marne, we wouldn't be doing a good job of representing Champagne. Um, so that's, it's very, very important for me that, you know, Customers can come to us and find great stuff from the old, great stuff from the saison, great stuff from Sud Epernay, you know, to really represent the the region, um, the terroir, the right. styles. Also, it's important. I mean, I don't know about for you, um, but um, for us, demi sec is like, you know, I, I can only carry. I think I've got two or three skews because it's so quiet with demi sec. But I still want to have one, you know. I mean, if he's too bad to yeah, let it go. I agree. <laughs> I mean, trying to find trying to find a good quality demi sec is really really hard. Outside of you know the big brands like Food, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I I think demi sec, especially being here in the south and having a lot of like spicy cuisines, demi sec yeah. would be excellent. But trying to find one, either either distribute distributors have it or they and they just don't have a lot of it or it's just not on the market at all at least yeah. in texas um, no. and it is the ones that are on the market are you know they're they're the big negotiants there's nothing that's super small production 
um, yeah. boutique style, which I haven't had. I haven't had any Gore and Demi set, which is definitely on my list of things to try. So yeah. I, I definitely will um, get with you and try and get some cool names and some producers to try out to try some nice Demi set. That's yeah, cool. no, I mean, there's so many good, oh. good good applications for it, but it seems like, uh, you know, the demand is um, the demand is about to the point where it's affecting the supply. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You are, you, are, you are right about it. And, and the thing about it is that um, Demon Sec, Demon Sec kind of fits along the lines, like, but understand that's more along the lines of what Champagne was before, you know, before Boot Style was. So Champagne was a sweeter style beverage um, historically. And it wasn't until like the late 19th century where it became this super bone dry style. Thank you, Lady Pomery, for that. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's been rolling that way ever since. So no, it definitely, definitely is a style of champagne. I think that's very, very hidden in every market. Um, that should get a lot more, uh, get a lot more credit. Uh, moving along, in your opinion, what sets KNL approach to purchasing champagne apart from other wine importers? And are there any unique qualities or values that guide your decision making? Oh, absolutely. So I would say that um, the, you know, to answer the second part of the question first, um, I'm really just the, the value that I have is delivering value to my customers. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, I want, I want to make sure, especially on the direct import side, um, to have, have things that are going to just really take their dollars far. And that, you know, links directly into what's different about our approach and our, our approach is we are a importer, um, you know, we, we're a selector who imports and then sells directly to customers. So, right. um, you know, we're, we're taking out two layers of markup in our, um, you know, by doing it that way. And, it, you know, we're able to offer, you know, Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc from a good growers at $35 a bottle retail because of that. And um, that to me, being able to offer real value to the customer is, is you know, my, my number one, um, my number one value for myself. I mean, that's one of the things that um, I would love to see. That's one thing I'm really, really big on, even in my research and looking for it different champagnes is champagne that is one that's affordable in cost uh, consumers naturally think the champagne which it, it naturally is isn't a beverage that is uh, a skew that's very very expensive but there are some yeah. champagnes like you said around that 45 40 dollar range yeah. that is great that's great yeah. quality uh, that's out there and you just have to as a as a person being a buyer and um, importing try and find them because there is some really really good stuff that you can pay half the price that you would probably pay for a normal bottle of champagne that's going to be just as good. Yeah. And that's to me, you know, the, it's, um, it's, it's really is true that the champagne, it's, it's, it's a premium product and, you know, the, the, the rules are so strict. The climate is so difficult there. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why there's, there's an entry fee, you know, but, um, you know, there's also, there's also, you know, people there who are making stuff. On podcast, we definitely discuss healing. We discuss uh, aspects of psychology. Um, we discuss like, you know, you becoming the best you. Mm -hmm. Mental wellness. For sure. Health. Femininity. Parenthood. Dating. Definitely as dating. Single parents. Um, and it's from a lens of two psychologists, you know, yeah. so, um, but also two, two people who grew mm -hmm. up like with both parents, mm -hmm. married parents. And then like, you all know that Chloe and I are the youngest of our crews, like her yeah. siblings and my siblings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So it's from that looking, perspective. Yeah. Looking at that. life through that lens. Yeah. So you're going to get a whole lot of things from us. Mm hmm from us being women mm -hmm. going through life as parents and all of these awesome attributes but yeah that's womanology the study of women the study of women <laughs> who aren't um you know they're not hiring mbas to dream up uh you know dream up 
these price points. They're 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 basing their prices on their costs. Right. And to me, right. um, you know, being a simple man, <laughs> I like doing business that way. You know. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Totally, totally agree. All right, now turning to the U.S. market, what trends have you observed recently in terms of champagne consumption? Are there any particular styles or producers that have gained popularity in your eyes as of, as of late? Oh boy, you know, so many people are 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 coming up, um, you know, because I think of some of the giant missteps by some of the biggest companies um, with their pricing. I mean, we've seen um, prices of things like Dom Perignon almost double. Um, yes. You know, the price of Cristal almost double. And, you know, I, I am a full believer in, you know, the producers being able to make money. But, you know, that's not gas and glass. That's not inflation. Um, right. You know, that's, that's a repositioning of, of the brands. And, right. you know, frankly, we've seen a tremendous drop off in demand for those, those people that have, or those, those companies that have decided to do these just absolutely radical price increases. Right. And that has made a lot of room for, for people that have been more reasonable um, to come through. And, um, and, and, you know, for us on most of our direct import stuff, uh, I've been able to hold prices, even though my price in euros has gone up because of the windfall of the currency. And, Absolutely. you know, that's, you know, I was looking at the euro today and it's down at like 1.05, 1.05, almost 1.06, but it's, you know, a lot of this stuff is, um, I think, a little bit misguided with the price increases. And I think that the people that have been more reasonable have got that, that windfall. But in terms of styles, um, you know, I definitely see more of an interest in, um, in, in zero dosage stuff. Um, and I think that that has, that's about 50% to do with the foods that people are having, ha having with their champagne when they're, when they're using it as a wine for their dinner and about 50% because of climate change <laughs> and, you know, it, without, they don't need the dosage anymore on a lot right. of this stuff. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's no need to, you know, and that goes right to our next question that we're going to talk about climate change is that. There's no need for the added sugar. You know, there's no reason for the high dosage anymore because the fruit is just naturally ripening uh, because of the warmth that's hitting champagne at record level, at record level on levels right now. And I've, I've I was reading things during harvest, like people were actually passing out. They couldn't even imagine, you know, in the region of Champagne, people passing out from harvest in an area that has an average temperature of around 50 degrees. I think it's up to like 70 now, uh, yeah. which is ironic. Uh, which is yes. ironic. Sadly, it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, sadly, I heard of two fatalities. Absolutely. I, did. Yeah. I, think I heard that as well. I think I did read that two people did pass away from uh, actually doing harvest, which is in that, in that area, you just don't think it gets that warm. I mean, traditionally, no. it never gets that warm. It gets that no. warm there. Heading to our next question, a great segue when you said um, about climate change. How has climate change been affecting, and we all know it's been affecting the wine world. Have you noticed any changes in the taste or characteristics of champagne due to climate change? And are and there are, and are there any specific challenges or opportunities that presents uh, that this presents for champagne as an industry and also as a region? Yeah, you know, I mean, absolutely. I've been noticing. Um, uh, I'll never forget coming back from tasting the Van Clare um, in the spring of of two thousand nine. I tasted all the two thousand eights. Okay. And, I came back and my dentist said to me, what did you do to yourself? What did you do to your teeth? <laughs> and now I come back from my buying trip and the dentist looks in my mouth and doesn't say anything. It's just like, I mean, the, the wines are so much softer than they used to be. And I mean, this is, I mean, this is just talking about my short 23 year career. I mean, they have 
absolutely transformed, um, you know, especially when you're talking about tasting Van Clare. And most recently we did um, our staff summit where I get all of my guys that help me in the different stores with champagne. And we have all of the major vendors come in from the big houses um, and show us wines. And the number one, I mean, the, the vintage that we tasted the most of was 15. And um, boy, I don't know what you've been noticing, but for me, I've been tasting a lot of 15s that are both low in acid and yeah. also a little vegetal um, from, you know, like a Paso Robles style um, shutdown from heat. Yeah. And yeah. Um, some of the, the 15s are really pronounced in their vegetal character. and. That's new. Uh, that's real new. <laughs> no, that's great. That's kind of that's kind of how I feel about eighteen. Eighteen uh. has that very that's that nice softness softness to it. It's not racy. Um, everything just seems very very balanced. Yeah, um, I heard the nice same thing about our nineteen and twenty is going to be the same. Also, when those finishes drop, uh, when they get released, it's going to have that nice balance and elegance to it. But no, fifteen for sure. Fifteen and eighteen for sure. I have to say are probably two of the softest. Um, yeah, very approachable and easy drinking vintages I've probably had in a while. Yeah, and I think that also the um, the benefit. I mean, you were talking about the opportunities. Is it? It seems like between fifteen and eighteen, the producers, um, the growers, learned a lot about about managing the heat. Because I don't, I just tasting the non vintages that are based on eighteen and some of the early release eighteen vintages. And as well as the Van Clare, I just didn't taste as much vegetal problems, even though, like 15, it was an absolute record-breaking hot vintage. Um, I also, I, I think that the, the producers, there's a, that there's a, lot of, um, a lot of opportunities for the growers to do basic heat protection stuff in, in the vineyard that, um, that they've never wanted to do because for a thousand plus years, hot vintages are always better in champagne. Right. So that's not right. an idea that's going to change overnight. But certainly, you know, they could, you know, California producers, uh, Australian producers, you know, producers from hotter climates, um, you know, have a lot of tricks that right. are, you know, their public knowledge that, that the, the producers in champagne can share. And I, I think that it's, you know, there's 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 great opportunity to um, for for preserving acidity in in a warmer climate. Um, you know the guys at the CIBC they said oh you know we've got contingency plans up to X number of degrees, right? And they said that after X number of degrees we're not really going to be worrying about champagne. <laughs> <laughs> well, two two. Uh one group I know is probably very happy with climate change and they're hoping that things stay get, continue to get warm in, um, in Champagne is English. The English bubbles, cause they're, they're getting more of the traditional style Champagne where they already have the natural soil type. The temperature is getting along the lines that we historically think about Champagne. So I'm sure the English are over there pumping their fists like, just keep getting hot, just keep getting hot. <laughs> stay warm. Get warm, champagne. Keep getting warm. We just gonna stay warm. So I know they are extremely ecstatic about the change happening in Champagne. Um, oh, going back real quick, you was talking about um, the last question. We were talking about the, um, you know, the money and how you know certain brands are raising their prices um, dramatically. I like to call it the LVMH tax. That's, <laughs> yes, that's what I like to call it. The, the LVMH tax. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know who LVMH is, that's Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, and a lot of your very big uh, champagne brands from Vouv to Krug, uh, Dom, they are all under the LVMH um, label. And yes, Moet. Um, so, yes, if you are a part of LVMH, your prices will most likely go up tremendously, which is okay because you know, they, they, they have the, the, the say so to do so. Um, so that's just my two cents on the prices going up for those. Two yeah, numbers. they all are great. I love, I love them all. Love them, love them all. But uh, moving forward, so how do you see the role of sustainability and environmental practices evolving within the champagne industry? 
And are there any initiatives or efforts that KNL supports in this regard? Yeah, no. I mean, I think the 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 certifications for high env high environmental value um, to me are it's the most important um, moves in Champagne. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of completely organic biodynamic producers too making making wonderful stuff, but I I really believe that the steps that can be taken together with many many people taking those steps um, just have a real much bigger impact than you know a few people going you know completely completely biodynamic um, yes. I think that the folks that are doing biodynamics um, for their own you know for their own philosophy and for their own quality um, I'm all for it but I think that for for the planet and for champagne as a whole I think that these um, these more incremental uh, certifications are really starting to have an impact I mean when I first started going to champagne um, you know there was still garbage in the vineyards yes um, yes you know Yes. And Can you speak on that a little bit? Like, like, for those who don't know, like, what what was Champagne doing with their soils in regards to the garbage in the soils? Yeah, I mean they they were bringing they were bringing literally bringing garbage in from Paris to try and um, keep their keep their their topsoil from you know blowing down the hills um, because they were using just you know absolute just um, you know basically napalming everything with herbicides pesticides um so now now it, it's a law that you have to have a certain number of um of rows with grass in them and you know these steps that they've taken together um boy it's transformed the place since i first started going i mean it used to absolutely we, years ago we were um the importer for 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 mr fleury the first of all the biodynamic producers yes. in and you know he um he unfortunately passed um this year um and now his his um his his heirs are, are running the property and doing a great job but um you know i mean it was just like there there was him and a few other people doing organics and then there was a lot of people just like really, really coming down hard with the chemicals. So um, I've seen great progress over my career and it's the progress keeps on being made. And, you know, I think that um, I think that they're 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 being pretty good stewards of the land there. Um, you know, it's uh, it's nice to see the see those steps being made and you know promoting um producers who are careful stewards of the land is is really important for us awesome awesome are there any specific producers that you currently find exciting that, that are new to the u.s market that, that customers should be looking out for can you share some of their insight as far as their wine making philosophies or, or their unique offerings yeah i mean you know for us we have we've started working relatively recently with um with a producer in the cote de blanc by the name of damian hugo um nice. and okay he uh he is just blessed with incredibly old vines in 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 both cramel and shui and also nice. in, in the in the rarely talked about uh Grown crew of Wari, and he's working all with large wood. Um, okay. He's one of these producers that isn't interested in in organic certification, um, but he and his wife are, you know, they're they're ten hours a day out there in their vineyards um, doing doing the handwork, and they are very very. Um, reluctant to use um to use chemicals but um at the same time um you know they're 
they're not willing to to give up the option you know especially in light of of the recent 2021 disaster um for for organic producers i have one producer who um who's who was in conversion to organics in 2021 and didn't even fill the press load the press up once with 50 acres not a single press load lost everything wow yeah so that's I mean that's 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 pretty pretty tough stuff. But you know, I really like the work that Damian Hugo is doing. Um, you know, for 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 producers that are um, available more broadly, um, <laughs> it's a definitely not a new producer. Maybe the oldest of all the producers, Go Say. Um, but boy, big respect to the folks at Go Say. Um, you know. They have not been charging us the LVMH tax, um, and you know their grand reserve, which I think in most major markets is a fifty dollar, sixty dollar retail. Uh, I mean, the current release it's five years on the lease. I mean, that is a serious bottle of champagne. Um, that is, you know, for for a, for a very 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 good value. So I mean, I, I give a big shout out to. To, to go say for uh, you know doing really nice work and I love their um, they do some of these specialty products like the Gram Reserve that's been in the cave for 12 years or 15 years with their their 15 on and their 12 on and I think those are super super interesting um, wines um, I also I really love the stuff that's being done with Arbon and Melier um, it sort of goes okay. back to the climate change. Uh, discussion, you know, they're higher acid um, indigenous grapes, and um, boy, you know, the, the there's a producer called Aspazi that does this cepage d'Anton, which is um, just made out of the old varieties that I think is just dynamite and um, so zippy um, and requires, you know, a long time on these before release, you know, always more than eight years. And um, boy, I'm into that one. Cool, cool. Oh, one thing I want to ask you also for those also who don't know, can you explain to our guests what is a Vin Clear? For those who aren't oh. familiar with what a Vin Clear actually is. Yeah, so they call the um, after the primary fermentation is done on the grape juice, um, and the, the the grape juice has been turned into a wine, but before it's been bottled and made to sparkle. Um, that's what they call Van Clair or clear, just the literal translation of clear wine, um, non bubbly wine in, in, in champagne. And it, and it rips with a lot of acid. I would oh, say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's funny, uh, you know, having, I've, I've now tasted uh, 23 vintages of Van Clair. And nice. I still, I still have no idea how folks how the folks in Champagne um, taste these Van Clairs and are able to do the blends that they do and to, you know, declare vintages and to look out into the future the way they do. I mean, when I leave, I come away with ideas like, wow, you know, like this was a good year for Chardonnay or this was a good year for Meunier or, you know, boy, they had problems in, in this area and they did well in that area. But it's just general ideas that I come away with. Um, you know, the way that the, the, the Champenois themselves can taste that Van Clair um, and then make those blending decisions, that's a uh, hats off to them. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally, I totally a thousand percent agree with you on that. A final question for the main interview portion is finally, what advice would you give to champagne enthusiasts who want to explore and appreciate the diverse range of champagnes available? Are there any recommendations or strategies that you can offer? You know, one of the most fun things that um, that you can do, um, and it's a presentation that I do myself all the time. But it's something that you can you can do if you've got a, a, a access to a guy like Cornelius or uh, <laughs> or you know an, an expert is to is to come up or, or go to a good good wine shop and and ask um, for a champagne um, that's all all Meunier, a champagne that's all Chardonnay. A champagne that's all Pinot, a champagne that's a blend of all three, a champagne that's a vintage, and a champagne that's a rosé. And you get together with a group of friends, and you open all six of them, 
Um, and I think that that's something that will just give you an incredible, um, you know, a, a level of knowledge that, that um, or an experience that most people wouldn't have. Um, and I think that that's really, um, the, the, the joke in the industry is that champagne is um, the easiest of all wines to drink, but the hardest of all wines to taste. Um, oh, yeah. And I, think, <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> and I think a lot of what makes it hard to taste is because you sh most of the time when you're drinking champagne, you show up to a party. And Absolutely. It's not pour, taken serious. Yeah. They, you, they pour you this in, in, in a flute with a you know, with a, a hole about that big, you know, you flute, you can't even get your nose in and it's exactly. ice cold and you're trying to remember like 15 people that you just met's names and it's not very conducive to tasting. Well, well with Cabernet Sauvignon, almost anybody who's got a passing interest in wine has sat down and just had two Cabernets next to each other. But not a lot of people do that with champagne. I know you do, <laughs> but not a lot of people do. And just um, to, to, to do a tasting with friends of the major varieties, a blend, a vintage, and a rosé, um, I think is a real big eye-opener and a place to get started. Nice. So we're going to move on now to the last segment of the, of the interview, and I like to call these the pop-the-court questions. So I'm going to shoot you some rapid-fire questions, about six of them. And just give me your thoughts and insight. First thing that comes to mind. What is your favorite place to drink champagne? Lake Cryer and Rams. <laughs> I love, right. you know, if you get a chance to go and you can go to Restaurant Le Parc, it, you know, it's the it's the Michelin two star there in, in Rams and uh, the glassware, the selection, um, all the atmosphere. Uh, Hard to beat. <laughs> I would definitely add that. You gotta, you gotta inbox me that one. DM me that place. For sure. I will. <laughs> definitely. All right. What is your favorite place to buy champagne? Um, you know, I, well, I guess I've got to be selfish at K and L. <laughs> That's where I buy mine. <laughs> Understood. Understood. What is your favorite champagne grape and why? Wow. That's, um, you know, like being asked to pick the same children because I love them all. Um, but probably the most profound experience I ever had with champagne was with Mounier, um, which gets put down a lot, but is prized by, you know, both Krug and Biacart Samon for different mm -hmm. reasons. And, um, you know, the, the 1964 René Collard, who's the... Um, the grandfather of, of what is now Collard Picard, um, that the night his 1964 was was the the greatest greatest champagne I've ever tasted, um, and I I think that Meunier is um, it's indigenous to the region. It tells the story of the region, and when it's when it's taken seriously, when it's grown seriously, um, made seriously, and aged seriously. Um, you know, it's um, it's underappreciated. I think that's actually mine as well, and I think that's actually the grape that fits the American palate. Like it is, this youthfulness is you know us. We you have to be a serious, serious champagne enthusiast to, to want to store champagne. Because most people, when they get it, they want to drink it. Yes. And I always tell them, if you try to drink this now, get some Mouillet because Mouillet is phenomenal. It's everything that it's kind of like the, I call it like the 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 little the little brother the Pinot. Kind of the, the, the great little brother to Pino, uh, has all the great food quality times 10 to me. Um, and it's it's very, 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 very phenomenal. I'm kind of still iffy on the Mounier Rosés, um, but I have found a few that I, that I love. But I, I believe that Mounier actually is the grape of the American palate, for sure. All right. What is your unicorn wine? What is one champagne you have not tried and is on your list to try? If money was the object that you would go for right now, I've never had one of those twenty ones. Um, a lot of people say that it was the greatest. The I only listen to nineties music podcast is a show for eighties babies who were nineties kids. If you were a No Limit soldier, 
then this is your show. If you believe that cash money is not an army, but was a Navy, this is the show for you. If you and your friends ever tried to sing a song written by Escape, in vogue shy or voiced men at a talent show during middle school this is your show the only listen to 90s music podcast is a bunch of 80s babies talking about all the songs and things that we loved when we were kids and teenagers so if you went to the skating rink and you were at a lock-in this is the the show for you if you think that tevin campbell um was the original prince of r&b this is the show for you if you don't understand the the conflict between Monica and Brandy, but you're kind of on Monica's side and understand why Brandy got punched. This is the show for you. Make sure that you tune in, subscribe, click the little subscribe link. We're here. We're going to talk about all things 90s music. This is the show for you. Teenager of all time in Champagne. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I would uh, I would love to try that that the 21 Salon um yes. that would be uh that would be a great thing to try um so i think i'll go with that <laughs> that is a that is a perfect one perfect one all right what is your favorite style champagne style i i really like um fresh high acidity campaigns um okay for, for my favorite style because I think that they work really, really well for the aperitif. And also um, my my wife and I, we have a few traditions, weekly traditions, and, and one of them is sushi and champagne. Um, so we love we love to either make make our own or get some takeout and 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 have have champagne and sushi or go to one of the one of the few few restaurants that does Japanese food with with a good um, with a good uh, nice. lift of, of champagne. So I really do like the a, a higher acid style. I've been really enjoying the 13s and the 14s. Um, telling everybody who will listen to me that to load up on them because you know there's going to be plenty of hot vintages to buy, and if you if you miss one, there's plenty in the pipeline. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And last question. If champagne could talk, what do you think it would say about those who drink it? You know, champagne is such a generous beverage. I think that if champagne could talk, it would thank you for drinking it. <laughs> I, 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 it's, um, you know, the, the spirit of the champagne wall when you go there is, is so generous. I think that the bubbles themselves, um, you know, the bubbles themselves can even even make a champagne show well in um, a far um, less than perfect drinking vessel. Um, I think it does a lot of the job that a, a carbonation does a lot of the job that a glass would normally be forced to do. Even though a good glass is always better than a not so good glass, <laughs> but um, I think that. Um, for for me, I think the champagne would say thank you. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, where can people find you? Social media or any way if they want to reach out to you to get some good champagne advice. What's the best way to get in contact with you? So on social media, I'm Champagne Gary Westby um, on Instagram, um, and then I can also be reached um, by the staff directory at klwines.com, and my email is easy. It's just Gary Westby at klwines.com, so I can be reached that way as well. Um, but I'm very active on Instagram, posting videos all the time, doing posts all the time. So, um, and check my DMs real, real regularly on that. Well, thank you. One thing I will say that I'm, I will be remiss not to say this is that I really love your passion. Um, your video, videos really, really inspire me and. Uh, thank you again so much for being a part of Simply Champagne and I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you in the industry and I can't wait to sit down and drink some bubbles with you. I can't wait either. I, um, if, any, if I'm ever in Texas, I'm going to come out and see you and if you ever end up coming out to, to California, Please. you got to let me know. 
definitely, definitely. Well, thank you guys again for another episode. This is Cornelius signing off and Gary signing off. And you guys always remember, for your only pain in life, be champagne. Oh. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much, oh. Mr. Gary. No, thank you. Thank you so much for um, having me.